On Wednesday evenings, we've had many interruptions for different services and things, and so we're not making a lot of headway in the life of the patriarchs, the faith like our fathers. It reminds me, I have a friend I talk to weekly, a pastor friend, and for about two years, he's on Wednesday evenings, he's been teaching through the book of Revelation. And I told him the other day, I said, you've been on that two years. If you don't hurry, you guys are going to be living that as you teach it. You might need to wrap it up. So we're not making a lot of headway. We have moved to the life of Jacob, to the life of Jacob. For those of you that aren't familiar with our Wednesday evening Bible studies, we do it differently. I get into this and just tell the whole story, and then I come back at the end and quickly make some points that I believe God would like us to understand and to draw from that study. Tonight, I want to talk about living. You might expect the dream, but no, living the lie in the life of Jacob, living the the lie, faith like the Father's. Let's pause and let's ask God to do eternal things in our hearts tonight. Father, this is your word and forever your word is settled in heaven and your word is a living thing. Lord, may your word be a living thing tonight in our hearts and minds. Lord, I pray you would speak to us and, oh God, challenge, encourage, strengthen, whatever our need is. But, oh God, move mightily in our hearts with your eternal word and may we have a growing sense of your presence as we proceed through the teaching tonight. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Our story tonight is a story of deviousness and deceit and duplicity, and it's a story of a dysfunctional family. And yet, in spite of all of that, God has a plan. We're going to see that this evening. How many is glad to know that the Bible covers all of human life? And human nature. That's what these stories do. They reveal human nature and then they reveal the faith that can rise up in spite of that human nature. We're going to see that this evening. I remember as I began this story going clear back to when I was very young, probably about eight or ten, but I can vividly remember this evening when um, this evening. I can remember when my pastor's wife, Sister Buford, taught on this story. And I remember the statement she made as she told this story. She says, you can see how one lie leads to another and to another. And then she showed that. That's what we see in this story. That's the trouble of going down that road of duplicity. You tell the first lie, you have to tell the second lie to cover the first lie. And all of a sudden, things have gotten very badly. Let me go back to when Sister Buford said that. As a kid, I thought of only telling lies. It's when I grew older and began to understand life that I realized we usually don't tell lies, we usually live lies. Right? We live lies more than we tell them. You see, most people are not living the dream. If they were honest, they're not living the dream. They're living a lie. We're going to see tonight that Jacob tried to cover up who he really was and act as if he was someone else. That's living the lie. Cover up who you really are and act like you're someone else. Now, here's the problem. It's bad enough to put up a facade and a mask between you and people. But the worst thing about that is you bring that mask and facade when you come before God. If there's ever a time the facade, the mask, The real you needs to come out. That's when you come before God in his presence. That's how we get help. And so let's let's look at just a little bit of the text before I tell the story. And by the way, Jacob, in trying to act like he was somebody else, showed who he really was. When we try to live the lie... We show who we really are, ultimately. So let's read just a few verses that will capsulize and and, and spotlight what we're going to be talking about tonight. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. And by the way, I've got to move forward, but Hebrew, the Hebrew language and those that use it love these sort of things. When Jacob said, I'm a smooth man, he was referring to his skin. He wasn't hairy, but he used the same word that was used for a smooth talker. 
And he's condemning himself even as he describes himself. Because he's going to try to talk smoothly. He was a smooth man. Not just because he lacked hair, but he was a smooth man because he was deceitful. And he talked. He talked. Verse 12. My father peradventure will fill me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. You could circle the word seem. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. Verse 16. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him. Isaac felt Jacob and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And Isaac discerned him not because his hands, Jacob's hands, were hairy from the goat's hair as his brother Esau's hands, and so he blessed him. So let me tell you the story tonight. If you'll just stay on the train till we get through the story, it'll make the points far more poignant this evening. But Isaac knew he was getting old. In fact, he'd become blind with age. And he didn't know when he would, as we used to say, he didn't know when he was going to kick the bucket. It could be any day. So he thought it was time to to make clear his intention of who his heir was going to be, who his successor was going to be. And, but he also, in making this clear, saw a way to get his favorite meal. The scripture is clear. Isaac loved venison. And so he said, why not make this thing of getting the blessing to my son, transferring the blessing to my son, why not make that an opportunity to get my venison as well? And so he called Esau, the son he loved, the older son, and he said to him, I never know when I'm going to die. I've gotten old, and tomorrow I could die, so I want you to get your bow and your arrows and go out into the wilderness and kill a deer, bring it back, cook it just the way I like it, and then I will give you a blessing before I die. And so Esau does that. But here's the problem. Mama Rebecca, who favored her younger son Jacob, was eavesdropping. What is it with this family? They're always, the women are always eavesdropping. Isn't that right? What was Sarah doing when the visitors talked to Abraham? The Bible's clear. She was at the door of the tent eavesdropping on Abraham. And what's Rebecca doing? She's eavesdropping on Isaac. She heard what he said about Esau, so she ran off to find Jacob and told him what she overheard. She said, now, Jacob, your older brother is going to get the blessing, but I've got a plan so how you can get this blessing, keep it from Esau, but you've got to do exactly what I tell you to do. So hurry. Go out to her flock and get two young goats, And I'm going to cook them with the seasoning and and the way, just like your father likes them. And then I'm going to have you take them to your father as if you were Esau bringing the venison back. And your father's going to eat the goat, thinking it's venison, and he's going to bless you. He's going to give you this family blessing. Jacob responded and said, wait a minute, Mom, there's a problem here. You know how hairy Esau is. Me, I'm smooth. I can hardly grow a beard. It's just peach fuzz. And Dad's going to feel my skin and know immediately it's me trying to deceive him. And he's going to curse me instead of bless me. Now, I'm going to stop and explain something very uh, uh, quickly here. But in the Bible times, people took words very seriously. Words had power to them. So if Isaac blesses one of his son, that stands. Words had power because, first of all, the leader had absolute power. The father had absolute power in the home. The king had absolute power in the kingdom. And when they said something, their word was law. But words also had power because it was an oral culture. We're used to things needed to be written down. If it's going to be official, it needs to be written down. They didn't write things down. It was oral, and so people remembered what was said and held people to what was said. That's the only way that culture could work. 
But it was also a matter of words having power because it was seen as a spiritual thing. What the father said, that was as if God was speaking to that family. The father's word became the will of God and the plan of God. And so this is why it was so important that when Isaac gave the blessing, who received it? If it was Esau, it stood for Esau. If it was Jacob, it stood for Jacob. So let's go back to our story. Jacob said, we got a problem here. He's going to know I'm not Esau. But mama said, Jacob, don't worry about that curse thing. You just do what I say. And if it goes bad, I will take the blame. I'll take the curse. I put in parentheses a question here. Would she really have, when you see how Rebecca acts later on, would she have really taken the fall for Jacob if Isaac had have discovered their scheme? So, Jacob He acquiesced. He went. He got the two goats, killed them, brought him back to his mother. She had been at work while he was gone. Rebekah had snuck into Esau's tent and stole some of Esau's clothes. So there's another good thing about Rebekah. She's She's a thief. She steals from her own children. She got Esau's clothes. She took the goats. She prepared them. She seasoned them. She cooked them. And then she called Jacob in, and the Bible says she dressed Jacob in Esau's clothes. Now, I haven't told you the age, but Jacob is 40 years old. This is a little awkward. He's 40 years old, and he's standing there as mama dresses him. She puts Esau's clothes on him. She takes the goat skins and cuts them a certain way and, and attaches them somehow to the back of his hands and arms and his neck. Then she gives him the meat of the goats and says, now go to your father and get your blessing. So carrying that plate of steaming venison, quote unquote, it was goat's meat, the smell of it's filling the air, and Jacob comes to his father and says, dad, I'm back. Now, this next part of the story, I'm going to tell it this way by noting two things. I want to show you how Jacob lies, 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 lies. But I also want to show you at the same time where Isaac ignores red flag, ignores red flag, ignores red flag. There was all these indications that Isaac should have picked up on to know he was being deceived, but he chose to ignore the red flags. Why? Because he smelled the venison in the room, and he loved the venison. So here we go. Here's the first lie. Jacob was acting like he was... Esau returning. I I remember something else Sister Buford used to tell us. She says, the Bible doesn't say that those that are sent to hell aren't just those that tell a lie. And she's correct. It says those that make a lie. You didn't really say that. You You told mom I'm going to Walmart and you just left out you were going to Johnny's on the way. Or you you act a certain way to leave an impression. So Jacob didn't come in saying, Hey, Dad, I'm Esau. That would be a little suspicious. But he acted like he was Esau. The first first lie was he acted that way. It's then that Isaac got the first red flag. Isaac knew it didn't sound like Esau. He knew that wasn't Esau's voice, and he knew the time frame. It was too soon for Esau to have gotten to the wilderness and killed the deer and prepared the venison. That's, that's when, in response to that red flag, Isaac said, Who are you, my son? Isn't that an odd question to ask one of your kids? My son? If it's your son, you know who it is, right? That's an indication of a red flag. Here's the second line. Jacob just came right out and said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. He didn't actually say he went and killed the deer. But to divert attention back to the meat that Isaac so loved, Jacob said, sit up. That's all he said. He said, sit up and eat this venison so you can bless me. Now, he's lying. That's not venison. That's goat's meat. The second lie. Then he told, then he, the, 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 excuse me, I could, they're both of these together, but let me just give you the second and third together. He said the meat was venison. But he was acting as if he had been to the wilderness 
and gotten back in that short period of time. So here's the second red flag. Isaac knows that there's been too little time for Esau to have scouted, located, hunted the deer, killed it, brought it back, and fixed it. Maybe it's the time of day. So Esau asks the question, how did you find the deer so quickly? Did you shoot it in the camp? I mean, how did you get this deer so quickly? That's a red flag. That's when Jacob tells the fourth lie. He actually says, we'll deal this with this in the truth. Jacob says, I killed it quickly because God helped me. God caused that deer just to walk right in front of me. You never dream. I mean, just out of nowhere, God sent the deer to me. That was the third red flag. Something didn't seem right about all that. So Isaac asked Jacob to come near to him so he could feel his skin. The fifth lie is that Jacob went to Esau, and as dad rubbed his hands on the goat's hair, Jacob allowed him to think that he was Esau. That's when there was a fourth red flag. Isaac could clearly tell that when Jacob spoke, it was not Esau's voice. It couldn't have been. The hair said it was Esau, but the voice said that it wasn't. That was another red flag for Isaac. The voice was wrong. And I, I, I'm hesitating because I, whether to take the time or not, but, you know, in the end, if we're honest, we can tell whose voice is speaking to us. Amen. We, we just don't tell the truth sometimes. We want to say, well, God said, and we knew it wasn't God. Or wisdom said, and we knew it wasn't wisdom. We know the voice. So Isaac asked, he said, well, he's got all these doubts, these red flags, but he said, go ahead and bring me the food. And he begins to eat, and he said, I'm, I'm about to bless you. Now, I want to stop for just a moment here because the blessing was God's way of passing down the leadership of the family and the ownership of the possessions of the family to the next heir. It was about position. It was about possessions in the family. But in this family, it's also about the promise because God gave promise to Abraham and it's that promise of what God is going to do, blessing the nations, ultimately sending Christ. That promise goes from Abraham to his successor, Isaac. And so whether Esau or Jacob gets this blessing means whether or not they get the promise of Abraham that God had made to him. So Isaac's just about to take this plate from Jacob, eat the meat and blessing, but Doubt struck Isaac again. Another red flag. Something's not right. And so he just came straight out. And he just straight out and asked Jacob, he said, Are you my son, the one named Esau? And Jacob told his sixth lie. He said, I am. This time he does speak the lie. Isaac said, Okay, then hand me the food and I'll eat it and I'll bless you. And as Jacob handed the plate to his father, Isaac gets another red flag. And he says, wait a minute. Step closer to me and kiss me, my son. That's perfectly acceptable in that, in that culture. Fathers kiss their sons. Men kiss men on the cheeks. And he said, as, as he took the plate from Jacob, he said, come closer, Jacob, and kiss me. What Isaac was wanting to do, he was wanting to get a smell of Jacob. Now, Rebekah knew this was going to happen. That's why she had Jacob put on Esau's clothes. And so when... Isaac, or excuse me, as Jacob reached down to kiss Isaac, Isaac's going, and he smelled Esau. He smelled the clothing of Esau. And yet, even at that moment, a final red flag hits Isaac. He gets another intuitive impression that something's not right. But he blesses Jacob. This blessing gave Jacob prosperity, possessions, position. And it's that position that's most important. Look at verse 29. Here's the part of Isaac's blessing to Jacob. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. That was meant for Esau. Esau is now going to have to bow to Jacob because Jacob has the blessing. I'm not going to tell the rest of the story except with just a very few sentences 
Because as soon as Jacob walks out of receiving the blessing, Esau walks in with the real venison. And the Bible says that Isaac literally began to tremble all over. If you're Esau, I've been deceived. That had to have been Jacob. And Esau begins to weep and cry and sob. But, oh, Father, bless me. Don't you have a blessing for me? And Isaac said, I I can't give you a blessing. I've already given everything to Jacob. And you can read the remainder of the story. We don't have time for me to give the details. So having heard the story, here's the truths. And there's many, but these are the ones I think are important tonight. Even families of faith are often dysfunctional. The families of the patriarchs were dysfunctional families. You know why families are dysfunctional? Because they're made up with flawed people. How many knows that even Christians, people of faith, have flaws? We don't want to admit it. I mean, look at this family. Isaac and Rebecca had picked a favorite son. You don't do that to your family. Everybody knew that Isaac loved Esau and Rebecca loved Jacob. They showed it. They favored that one. We could go on and on. You know, whether it was Abraham or Isaac, the dads were lying. They lied about their wives. This is our sister. We had all kinds of tension and fighting right there in the family. I mean, these families of faith were dysfunctional families. Now, I didn't tell you that tonight to justify dysfunctional families. I told you that to tell you this. Even though these families were dysfunctional, mighty God had a plan. And in spite of the dysfunction, he worked his plan and brought good and brought faith and brought victory from those families. And I'm here to tell you tonight, some families are more dysfunctional than others. But if people will serve the Lord and put their faith in Jesus Christ, God still has a plan. And he knows how to get a hold of people. And he knows how to work that plan. Oh, I wish there was time for all these. There's not. Let me just move on to the next truth. There will be someone in our lives, often very close to us, to encourage us to do what is wrong. She should have never done it. She was his mother. It wasn't just a peer. It wasn't just a good buddy. It was his mother that encouraged Jacob to be deceitful. I want you to know things have never changed. Human nature has never changed. You try to serve God. Please hear me tonight. You try to serve God. And there will be someone very close to you in your life that will come along and try to get you off track and try to get you to do wrong. If I had you lift your hands tonight, many hands would go up and say, that's been me. I've seen it happen right in the services. People that were close to different individuals during service, after service, talking to someone, trying to get them off track. We've got to watch that. It was his mother. Here's another truth. The desires of the flesh can blind us to what is spiritually important. Last time we had the story of the blessing of the beans and Esau sowed it the birthright for beans because he listened to his flesh. Isaac's real blindness wasn't his eyes. Isaac's real blindness was his love of venison. He kept ignoring red flags because he kept smelling the venison. And he loved, the Bible says, these aren't my words, it's the Bible's words. He loved that venison. How many knows when we listen to this old flesh, we'll miss what truly is spiritually important? You know, people who evidence little interest in and passion for spiritual things are people who are letting their flesh dictate their desires and interests and pursuits. This next truth, that, this, is a whole, this is a whole seminar here, but we must not ignore red flags. I'll tell you what, anyone that's married somebody that they really shouldn't have married and had all kinds of heartache in life, I promise you, in every case, they ignored red flags. How many knows that on the decisions that we make that turn out disastrous, we've ignored red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag that God has sent us? Amen. We must not ignore the red flags as Isaac did. Here's another truth. We don't need to do things wrong to bring about what God wants to do in our lives. Here's the bottom line. God had already planned, already determined, already foretold that Jacob, the younger, was to have the blessing. He was to be the leader. Jacob didn't have to do anything 
wrong and deceitful for that to happen. But he did what was wrong to try to bring about what God wants in our lives. So many times folks fall for that. They know this is what God wants, and so they try to do it their way. Here's another truth. If we, t- if we tell the first lie, we'll find it necessary to keep telling them. We already saw that. I'm not going to be redundant and go over that. But once Jacob began, each lie demanded another. How many remembers what Sir Walter Scott said? Anyone remember what he said? Oh, what tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. It grows. Here's one more truth, though there's others. We will have to pay for living the lie. Jacob Immediately had to pay. He had to flee his country, go to foreign country. Jacob, we're going to see, was deceived himself. Jacob paid and he paid and he paid and he paid and he paid because he had done that deceitful thing. So here's what we're going to take home tonight. First of all, we must be motivated by more than just the fear of being caught. I'm talking about really doing God's will, really pleasing him, really not living the lie. Be motivated by more than just the fear of being caught. Did you notice when I told the story that Jacob wasn't bothered by the fact that he was lying and deceiving? He was only concerned about being caught. He never said to his mother, we can't do this. This is deceit. This is wrong. This is sin. He said, mom, if we do this, dad's going to know we're going to get caught. That's an, that's an awful way to live your life. Not doing right because it's right, but only because you're afraid if you do wrong, you're going to suffer consequences. Amen. You know, it's kind of like speeding. Come on, let's be honest. It's usually not the guilt of breaking the law that keeps us from speeding, is it? What keeps us from speeding? We don't like tickets. It's the fear of getting caught. There's a better way. Here's another thing to take home. We must be more concerned with who we really are than how... We are seen to be more concerned about who we really are than with how we are seen to be. I had you circle this when, we, when I read it. But look in verse 12, what Jacob said. He said, my father peradventure will feel me and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. Wake up, Jacob. You're not just going to seem to be. You are a deceiver. But notice his concern. His concern was not that he was a deceiver. His concern was that... He would be seen as a deceiver to his father. Some people aren't concerned that they've grown cold or backslidden. They're concerned that they'll be seen as cold and backslidden. Right? Right? That was his concern. Then we must, let's take this home with us. We must not act spiritual when we are simply doing our own thing. Look, look, look here what Jacob said in verse 20. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found the deer so quickly, my son? And he said, he got real spiritual. Oh, Dad, because the Lord, thy God, brought the deer to me. That's how I got it so soon. Have you noticed how quickly people get spiritual when they want to do wrong? I used to tell the students at Bible school, I fear Feel sorry for God sometimes. You, you just blame God for everything. You're with one girl. You get your eyes on another. And so you go to the first girl and say, Oh, I prayed about this. I don't feel like you're God's will for me. It's God's will that you and I break up. They're blaming it on God because they had their eyes on another girl. How often do folks do that? I, I've seen that as pastor. You know, people get in their minds something they want to do. It's the wrong decision. They shouldn't do it. But they cut you off at the pass of offering any counsel because you try to say something to them. They say, oh, I've prayed about this, and I feel this is what God wants me to do. They, they get real spiritual and put it on God to cover them. That's what Jacob did. Last of all tonight, we must just honestly be open with who we are and let God make us and take us where he desires. Oh, what if Jacob? had not resorted to deception, to fakeness, to a facade? What if he had just said, look, I'm the second born. 
that's who I am. I'm not going to lie about it. And I don't know how God's going to do it. But God said he's going to give the blessing to me. And I'm just going to trust God to do it. But I refuse to act as someone that I'm not. I refuse to act like Esau because I am Jacob the second born. And I'm just going to be that. Esau knew who he really was. I didn't have time to tell that part of the story, but he just came right out and said to Isaac, he's a heel grabber. How many remembers that lesson? He's a heel grabber. That's When you read Jacob in the Bible, that's what it means, heel grabber, deceiver, trying to manipulate one's way to where God wants him. What are we going to take home tonight? Take away the facade. Now listen, I'm getting ready to close, but I, I want to talk to us. In Jacob's case, the facade was deception, acting like he was his brother. But I'm telling you, there's other facades tonight. And it's not because people have done wrong and done bad or trying to be bad and trying to do wrong. Some people have a facade because it hurts. How many knows what I'm telling you tonight? It's true. Some people hide behind a mask because they don't like themselves. And so they're trying to portray themselves as someone else. Some... They're afraid of rejection if people knew the real them. So they hide behind a facade. And a ma- I, you know, I don't want to think I preach this in vain. I want to tell you, people are people are people. And even tonight, there's some miserable folks underneath a facade and mask that they present and posture themselves at. Let me tell you something. The most wonderful thing you can do is to come into the presence of God and drop the mask and drop the facade and just be who you are in his presence. I'm going to tell you why that's so wonderful. Because if you'll do that in his presence, if you'll be who you are in his presence, he can make you and he can make me what we ought to be. But he can't work with the mask. He can't work with the facade. He can only work with the real us. Oh, what a relief someone would have tonight. If you just say, I'm tired of living behind the facade of mask, go ahead and come use it. But let me tell you this, and, and I know my mind was on the message, and maybe that's the only reason. But when I stopped to pray about this message tonight, about the mask and all of this, I put Pandora on to have some music as I prayed, and the very first song that came on was that old, old song that Billy Graham played at, Ever altar call, just as I am. I want to tell you, there's no better way to come to the Lord. Take away the facade, the mask, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I thought of the rest of us, you know, that, that seems more for the sinner, but I thought of us believer. Look at verse 3 here. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. One more verse. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. Do you hear that? That's why I wanted to read this last verse. We keep the mask up because we're afraid of rejection of people and people won't accept us and people won't. But look what he says, the writer of the song. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. That's who God receives, the person we really are when we come to him. And what will he do? Thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, and relieve. Because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God. I come, I come. This could be the night. I know it's Bible study. But this could be the night that changes somebody's life. You could say enough, enough of living a lie, enough of trying to be somebody I'm not, enough of hiding behind a mask. I'm going to come to the Lord just as I am without one plea. I offer no justification. I offer no argument. I offer no, no explanation i just say lord this is who i am and it's this me that needs you it's this me that needs you could you stand across the building thank you father lord i've told the story and shared the truths but only you god can enter the heart and the mind 
and speak and change. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, that somebody, that many, Lord, would just come to you and allow you to do your work in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I, please, I'm not saying everybody's a hypocrite and a liar. I'm just saying we just need to come to God just as we are. So how many would like to just begin to come and fill these altars? I hope, hope from front to back and just say tonight, I'm dropping the guard. I'm coming to God just as I am. Would you come? Amen. Believer, and if you're here tonight, you need to surrender your heart and life to Jesus. You don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to hide anymore. You just come as you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God loves us. He sees us. He knows us as we are. He knows our uprising and our down sitting. He's acquainted with all of our ways. He's intimately acquainted. Amen. Lord, I come to you. Oh, let's seek Him tonight. Just as I am, Lord. Just as I am, God, I come to you. Oh, God. Hallelujah. I'm not going to try to be someone I'm not. I'm not going to try to convince you, Lord, of something I'm not. I'm just coming to you, Lord. Hallelujah. I know you'll receive me. I know that person you will receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tossed about many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without. Oh, Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am. Thank God. Thank God. Why don't you come to him? Hallelujah. Why don't you come to him? Hallelujah. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just as I am and waiting not. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm one dark blood. I'm Jacob, Lord. I'm the second born. I don't know how I'm going to get the blessing. But you said you'd bless me. You said you'd help me. You said you had a plan for my life, Lord.
take my life, make my life all that you want it to be. Lord, please change me, change me. me change me